Hello everyone, this is Ryan Shields, the youth minister here at St. Joseph's, and I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about the Holy Trinity. Now, the Holy Trinity is what we call a mystery in the church, right? Meaning that while we do know a lot about it and why a lot has been revealed to us about the Holy Trinity, not everything is known, right? So there are going to be some aspects of the Holy Trinity that are really hard to explain and impossible to understand, understand because at the end of the day, it is it is a mystery of the church. However, this is just going to be the beginning of a four-part series, really, where we talk about each aspect of the Trinity. So look at this as just the intro, the overview. We get into in-depth a little bit of into each one of the persons of the Trinity, um, but to get started, we need to understand a little bit about how they all work together. Now, my favorite analogy for this is that you have God the Father, who is the lover, right? He is love. God is love. We've heard that before. Um, so God is the lover, the, the one who loves. The one who he loves is the beloved, right? The beloved of, G of God is Jesus. So you have the lover, the beloved, and the love that they share. So God is the lover, Jesus is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is the love that they share. I understand that that can be a little bit difficult to understand, a little bit hard to wrap your head around. Um, but if that works for you, if that explanation is like, oh yeah, that makes sense, great. We're going to go into a couple other explanations and talk a little bit more about how God can be three different beings um, as well. So let's start off with the awkward fact, right? So we're talking about one being, God, right? We're a monotheistic religion, meaning we only believe in one God. It's very clear from the beginning of scripture. Right? So the beginning of salvation history teaches us there is one God. One God and God alone. Right? All throughout the Old Testament we see this. Um, Moses prays to God. The, God speaks to him in the burning bush. Um, we have one God who is with Adam and Eve in the garden. And this was in a stark contrast to the different polytheistic religions at the time. That taught of many different gods. Right? So it was really important for the first apostles to differentiate and to let everybody know that no, 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 even though we believe that Jesus is God, right, the one God that our Jewish brothers and sisters are talking about, um, we believe Jesus is another aspect of that same God, right? So he's not two different people. We're not looking at there's the one God, which is the Father, the one God, which is the Son, and then the God that's the Holy Spirit who watches over us all. That's not really how it works, right? So we're, we, we definitely are, we definitely believe in one God. So there's only one being, right? But that one being has three different aspects. You have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if we look through the salvation history, we see that we have interacted with different aspects of God at different times throughout salvation history. In the beginning, there was God, right? We had God the Father. He interacts with, um, like I said, Adam and Eve, our first parents. And we see him all throughout the Old Testament. That's, by and large, who we're dealing with at the very beginning. Um, and then, when Jesus is born, he's the manifestation of God. He's God made man, right? But he's also truly God. So you have God the Father, and then God the Father is that, or God uh, the Son, Jesus, is that same God made man. So they're still part of the same being, which is God, but they're two different aspects of the same one. And then after Jesus dies, is buried and raised up into heaven, he leaves with us the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the one who is coming after me to be with you. So he wasn't referring to a physical person, but he was referring to the Spirit, the Spirit that filled the, uh, the disciples, the apostles on Pentecost. So we really do see this one God in three different persons all throughout salvation history. You have God the Father, right? And in, in it, we also see little bits and pieces where God the Son is sprinkled in, even when we're talking about just God the Father, right? There's, which is why, you know, early on, there were some Jews that said, no, no, Jesus is part of God. Right? And there were other Jews that said, no, it's only one God. There can't be another aspect of God. Well, when Jesus talks about himself as 
the word made flesh, right? And we also hear about the word being with God in the beginning. In the beginning, there was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? We refer, refer to Jesus as God later on, which is an important distinction amongst, for, for our faith, even among other some other Christian faiths that are out there today. We are a Trinitarian faith. So we do believe in that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they're part of the same God. There are other Christian denominations that don't believe that. So it's important to distinguish. Like, no, we believe that God is three different persons, but one being, right? So the last example that I'm going to give you guys for what the Trinity kind of means uh, before, like I said, I'll explain it more in depth as we get into God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit um, in our next few videos. But when we talk about God the Father, right, we're really talking about, um, or when we're talking about the Trinity, we're really talking about how they all work together. How it is three different beings wrapped up into one being. And I think my, my favorite analogy, and it's kind of, um, maybe it's cliche, maybe it's used, um, a little too often, but it is the, the shamrock, right? The, the, the clover that has three different leaves. You have one, one plant, right? But it has three distinct leaves and the leaves are, are different, but they're all part of the same plant. So that's really what we get with God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy Spirit. We have the Father who created. We have the Father who watches over. We have the Father who is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? He is this infinite being that we can't fathom, that is more than we could even think about, right? That's what fathom means. So he's, he, he's even more than we can imagine, God the Father. And in order to save us, because of our sin, he sent down himself, part of himself, which is God the Son. And God made man come down from heaven, born just like us, flesh and blood just like us, with the same pro proclivity or ability to sin, even though he remained sinless. He walks among us, teaches us, and then he suffers and dies and takes our punishment for us. And then when he leaves, he leaves behind something else. And it's another aspect of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the way that God works in the world now. We are part of God being in existence, right? We're all, everything that we know, everything that we see, is held within God. But that spirit that moves through the world is God's way of interacting with us. And it's its own unique person. So God the Father who created, God the Son who saved, and God the Holy Spirit who is now with us and will be with us for all eternity. This is how we interact with God. That's how God interacts with us. And theology is about that interaction how God interacts within himself and how we interact with God. So the more we study theology, the more we study God. That's what we need to be doing in, as a lifelong process. We're always going to be studying God. So like I said, this is a mystery. This is gonna be hard to understand. It's hard to fathom how it all works together. But at the end of the day, we know through revelation and through all the bits and clues that Jesus left us. We know that the Trinity exists and we know in a way how it exists. Now we'll go in, like I said, a little bit more into each one of the three persons of the Trinity. But until then, just think a little bit about that clover. Um, and while you're thinking about it, let's talk a little bit about St. Patrick, someone who really liked to use that analogy in his own teachings. St. Patrick of Ireland is one of the world's most popular saints. 
He was born in Roman Britain, and when he was 14 or so, he was captured by Irish pirates during a raiding party and was taken to Ireland as a slave to herd and tend sheep. At that time, Ireland was a land of druids and pagans, but Patrick turned to God and wrote his memoir, The Confessions. In The Confessions, he wrote, The love of God and his fear grew in me more and more, and as it did, the faith in my soul was roused, so that in a single day I have said as many as a hundred prayers, and in the night nearly the same. I prayed in the woods and on the mountain, and even before dawn. I felt no hurt from the snow, nor ice, nor rain. Patrick's captivity lasted until he was twenty, when he escaped after having a dream from God in which he was told to leave Ireland by going to the coast. There he found some sailors who took him back to Britain, where he was reunited with his family. A few years after returning home, Patrick saw a vision that he described in his memoir. Saw a man coming, as it were, from Ireland. His name was Victorious, and he carried many letters. And he gave one of them to me. I read the heading, The Voice of the Irish. As I began the letter, I imagined that in that moment that I heard the voice of the very people who were near the wood of Foclet, which is beside the Western Sea, and they cried out, as with one voice, we appeal to you, holy servant boy, who came and walked among us. The vision prompted his studies for the priesthood, and he was ordained by St. Germanus, the Bishop of Oxury, whom he had studied under for years. He was later ordained a bishop and sent to take the gospel to Ireland. Patrick arrived in Slane, Ireland on March 25th, 433. There were several legends about what happened next, but the most prominent claim claiming that he met the chieftain of one of the Jewish tribes who tried to kill him. After an intervention from God, Patrick was able to convert the chieftain and preach the gospel throughout all of Ireland. There he converted many people, eventually thousands, and he began building churches across the country. He often used shamrocks to explain the Holy Trinity, and entire kingdoms were eventually converted to Christianity after hearing Patrick's message. Patrick preached and converted all of Ireland for 40 years. He worked many miracles and wrote of his love for God and his confessions. After years of living in poverty, traveling, and enduring much suffering, he died on March 17th, 461. He died at Saul, where he had built the first church of, in Ireland. He is believed to be buried in Down Cathedral, Down Patrick. His grave was marked in 1990 with a granite stone. Patrick was a humble, pious, and gentle man whose love and total devotion to and trust in God should be a shining example to each of us. So complete was his trust in God that the importance of his mission, he feared nothing, not even death. Patrick is known for his poem of faith and trust in God, The Breastplate. It reads, Christ be within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ inquired, Christ in danger, Christ in the hearts of all that love me, Christ in the mouth of friend and stranger. St. Patrick's feast day is March 17th. See, I'm a big fan of St. Patrick because, well, I'm an Irish Catholic. My last name, Shields, has its root in Ireland. Um, we can trace our family all the way back to that little island off the coast of Britain. And uh, so St. Patrick's always hold a, held, always, always, has always held, excuse me, a special place in my heart. In fact, on the, the medals that I wear, one of them is a St. Patrick medal. I always keep him close to my heart. My youngest brother is named Patrick. Um, I don't know if that's because we were Irish or just because mom and dad liked the name. I don't know. But St. Patrick has always been close to my heart and close to our family. So I'm glad I got to share a little bit about his life with you. My favorite thing about him is that he was enslaved, was set free, and then came back to the people that enslaved him to bring them to the truth of Christ. The character that that speaks of, what that tells us about who he was as a person, is amazing. And I think one more thing about saints, especially with St. With Patrick, he's this myth, almost this mythological type of person for us, right? 
we think we know we hear all these stories about him but what's true what's not true and he's almost larger than life but we have to remember that these saints are real people they were just like you and me they were people that walked around there were people who disagreed with them people who loved them people who hated them and then people who thought they were the best ever but in the end the church after having examined their lives has decided that they were worth putting up on a pedestal for us to look at. So let's use the example of Patrick. Let's use the example of all the saints that we learn about. And let's help those or have those make us better people, better Christians, better Catholics. So until we talk to each other again, until we see each other on Zoom or wherever we see each other next, God bless, take care, and remember, the Trinity is like a clover, one plant, one being, with three distinct personas. So we have one God, but in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys.